Welcome to the International Word Center. On behalf of Rick and Helen, that's me and my wife, we just want to thank you for joining us for another episode of the Word of God and the moving of God's Spirit. So get your hearts ready. Get your expectation up. Because if you don't believe you're going to receive, that's what you will get. But believe you're going to receive something today that you need, something that's going to give you greater understanding, that's going to increase your confidence and faith in God to receive from him, that you'll see manifestation of things that you've been desiring from God, such as healing and deliverance and direction and correction and wisdom and insight. Whatever you need, God has already given to you. But everything that has been given by grace, freely given, must be taken, must be received by faith. And that's what we're here today to do is to teach a word of God to you that will stimulate your faith in him, that he'll be glorified because of all the good things that you and I are receiving from his hand. So let's get in the word today. But before we do, we always like to honor God with a prayer of thanksgiving. So join us right now. Just lift your hands before the Lord. And as we taught last week, why do we lift our hands? Because our hands represent our lives. And when we lift them up to God, we say, we belong to you. We're lifting up our lives to you, God. So just lift up your hands with me today and begin to offer up thanksgiving to God. Thank him for his love. Thank him for his mercy. Father God, we just come boldly before your presence right now. And we just say thank you, God, for all the things you've done for us, all the things you're doing and all the things that you have promised that you will do. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that has made us righteous. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for forgiveness of my sins. Oh, thank you, God, for healing of the body, God. Thank you for provision. Thank you for protection. Thank you for wisdom, God. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for working in us and never giving up on us. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. God, we just thank you for all your promises that find their yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for the precious gift of your spirit. Thank you, Father God, for your word and understanding and revelation of your word. God, we just say thank you, thank you, thank you, God, for keeping us and using us to your glory in Jesus' name. We also just want to give a quick thanks uh, to those who have been obeying God. Amen. Everything you do, you want to do it as unto God. We've been teaching a series started last week on why your reasons and your purpose. We need to be like little children when it comes to spiritual things and begin to ask ourselves why not asking others, but asking yourself. And today we're going to continue in that series of why. What's your purpose? What's your reason? You need to ask why you do what you do, why you believe what you believe so that you can be in sync with God. But we just want to say thank you out there, those who have been given to the ministry. Uh, if you haven't, you can join us by going to our website page and going to the donate button at the top and just uh, click on the button and you can give securely there uh, through PayPal. Or if you prefer at the bottom of any of, address, any of our pages uh, at our website, you can give by mail. There's a mailing address at the bottom. And that website is iwordcenter.org. That's I, letter I, W-O-R-D-C-E-N-T-E-R. The Word Center, I Word Center, International Word Center, iwordcenter.org. So if you want to give today, do it. If you want to continue to give, just let the Lord be your guide, purpose in your heart, what you want to do to support us. Uh, it goes toward righteous causes to promote the gospel and to promote the fivefold uh, ministry to the body of Christ that we can be built up and mature in the things of God, that we can be a force in the earth that the powers of darkness cannot withstand because God is on our side. Let me pray for you that those who are given or want to give or have given, just uh, lift your hands to the Lord. Amen. And, and be ready to receive. Just lift your hands to God like a little child. We believe God exists and that he stands ready to respond to you. And so if you need some financial uh, help right now and you've given, are you giving today? Just attach your faith to your act. Faith always has a corresponding act of obedience. And God has told us to honor him. And that's tithing. God has told us to be generous, to be a giver, to imitate him. 
And that's giving offerings, not just to ministries, but to other people, to your family members, to your neighbors. So if you've been generous, you can expect God to do certain things. He said the generous person will be watered themselves. In other words, when you have some needs, you'll get it. The measure you give out, if you give stingily, that's how it comes back to you. But if you give generously, it comes back to you good measure pressed down, shaking together, and running over. That's not just words to get you to give. That's a promise from God when you do it as unto him. So let me pray. Father, I thank you, God, for those who are giving to righteous causes and giving here to the International Word Center. And I pray, Father God, that you would move by your spirit and that you would show them favor today, this week, this month, and this year, God, that you will open up doors and give them uh, things, show them things to do, God, show them to put, show them things to put their hands to. And God, I ask that you would prosper it, that it would come to completion and maturity, that they would get a good return on all that they do. And you'll be glorified in Jesus name. Amen. Well, you're ready for some word today. Open up your heart, open up your spiritual ears and let God speak to you. Let him feed you today. Let him stir you up. So let's pray as we get ready to fellowship around the word of God. Hallelujah. I can't wait. I guess I'm going to have to because it takes time to do that. Amen. Uh, let's pray. Father, <laughs> we thank you for your love again. We thank you for your mercies again and your graces. And I'm asking right now, God, for your help. So oh God, we come before you right now in the name of Jesus. And I'm asking for your help, God. I'm asking for grace to speak and teach your word in such a way that it's easily understood that people get it and are doers of it, that it'll stir our hearts to live faith in you, God, and that we'll have clear clarity, have light to walk in, that we'll take what we see and hear and run with it, God. I pray also, God, for the gifts of the Spirit to flow, God, to your glory and to the benefit of all. I thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're getting picking up where we left off. We started a series last week. We do the, uh, these uploads on Thursdays and Sundays. This is our Thursday uploads. Uh, you can come here to the website and go to iWordCenter.church and see it there or go to our YouTube channel. Uh, but we've been teaching. We started a new subject, a new series on why, W-H-Y, question mark, why, with a subtitle of Living Before God. We said, what are you talking about? Well, if you missed last week's episode, go back and listen to it because we begin to lay a foundation of what we will be getting into more and more. But just for a quick little review, your why is your reason or your purpose. Uh, little children ask that question a lot as they're growing up. Why, mommy? Why, daddy? Why, 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 why? And sometimes you kind of brush it off and don't give them a reason. But as believers... In Jesus Christ, as believers in Father God, the creator of heaven and earth and everything else, we need to make sure our why is right. Our reason and our purpose for everything we do and everything we believe, our why needs to be right. Because, see, getting the right why is the key to living the life that God has ordained for you to live, that abundant life, that life of freedom, that life of overcoming, that life of victory, overcoming the world, the flesh and the devil. Because if your why, your purpose, your motives, your intent of heart, your reason for what you're doing is wrong, it leads you down the wrong path. You're not living on the narrow path. You're not walking in God's footstep. You're not imitating him. Our purposes our why should match his why. Our purposes should match his purpose. The other reason that you want to have your right, your, your why right, is because you can't receive from God or receive the rewards in this life or the, re or the rewards to come in eternity. You won't receive them if your, if your why is wrong. I mean, we could do a, a, a whole series just on this, but I'll give you a few reference points and we'll look at some more of them uh, further in this series as the Lord would lead us. But in Mark, I'm sorry, Matthew 7 and 21 in the BBE translation, it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will go into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the pleasure of my father in heaven, he who does the pleasure of my father in heaven, having a right why, your right reason and your right purpose. So our why for what, Ever we do spiritually, 
uh, in our relationships, in, our, in the workplace, in the marketplace, everything we do. That's why there's some occupations a believer can't do because your reason and your purpose better be <laughs> to please God. In 1 Corinthians 3 and 14, it says, if the work which any person has built on this foundation, any product of his efforts, whatever survives the test, he will get his reward. That scripture before it in the, I think the 13th verse or so, if some are going to build on the foundation with hay and stubble and precious stones, uh, but it's going to be tried by the fire, the spiritual fire and the, the precious stones I submit to you are things we are doing for the right purpose, having the right why. The things we're doing for the wrong purpose, like Jesus taught about it in Matthew 6, he said, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, make sure you do it with the, with the right why. He was saying, don't give your money to be seen. He says, don't pray to be seen. He was saying, you know, don't fast and, and act like you're fasting so people can see how, how godly you are. Then he said, if that's what you do it for the wrong why, the wrong reason, the wrong purpose, the you, that's all the rewards you're going to get. You know, the hand claps and the atta boys and the atta girls. No, he's saying, do what you do in secret as unto God. And those things you do secretly, God will reward you in this life and in the life to come. And in James, the fourth chapter, uh, just drop down to the third verse, it says, uh, well, right before that, in the second verse, it says, you do not have because you do not ask or you do ask God for them, the things you need or you want and yet fail to receive. See, your why, your purpose and reason for wanting things has to be right. They have to line up with God's way of thinking, God's ways of doing his purposes, his reasons. Because it goes on and says, because you fail to receive because you ask with wrong purpose. Your why is wrong and evil, selfish motives. Your intentions is when you get what you desire to spend it in sensual pleasures. So a lot of people I'll submit to you that are in church and in the body of Christ here teaching on prosperity and giving and blessing. But their why is wrong. Their purpose for wanting the blessings is wrong. You should want it to be blessed, to be a blessing. Of course, yeah, you get to spend some on yourself, but not all of it on yourself. Are you listening to me? So that's what this series is all about, teaching on what are right whys and how to get your why right, how to get your purpose right, how to get the reason you're doing or why you believe what you believe are the purpose uh, for what you're saying, right down to the very nitty gritty of your intent of everything you do. What is your intention? What is your motives? God looks on the inside and not on the outside. So anything we're doing, we need to include God in it and, and that we're doing it to please him. Uh, if your reason or purpose is something other than God centered, it's time to recalibrate your thinking, your believing and your doing. Let's read our foundational scripture and we're going to get into some few things today. Uh, we may not get completed with what I've got on my heart, but we'll go as far as we can. Uh, uh, go to John, the fourth chapter, uh, the 23rd verse, and I'm going to read this scripture. This is our foundational scripture. We read it last time, but we read a little bit more, but we're just going to read here at the 23rd verse. And it says a time will come. Jesus was talking to the Sumerian woman at the well. A time will come. However, indeed is already here when the true genuine worshipers, is that you? Are you a true and genuine worshiper of God? It goes on to say, we'll worship the father in spirit and in truth reality for the father is seeking just such people as these, as his worshipers. God is a spirit, a spiritual being, and those who worship him must Worship him in spirit and in truth, reality. We must worship God with the right why. Why do you worship? Come on. Why do you worship? Why do you sing songs? Why do you go to church? Why do you give? Why do you pray? All these things that you call worship, why do you do them? The truth is you need to be doing them 
because you're wanting to please God. Not for your pastor, not for your denomination, not for the Atta girls and the Atta boys. Hey, are you listening to me? Not that you're saying people saying you're such a righteous and a good person, uh, not to get the, the accolades and uh, get, get something written in the newsletter about you. Your purpose and your motivation needs to be because you want to please God. Are you listening to me? You know, why? Let's, deal, let's just d dive on into it and, and get a little deeper. Last week, we talked about a few things. Uh, we talked about raising your hands. Some people raise their hands and some people don't. And I submit to you, the reason some people don't raise their hand is because their why isn't right. And there's some people that raise their hand and don't have a right why, and they're doing it for the wrong purpose. They're doing it because they don't want people to think that they ain't spiritual. Some people don't raise their hand because they don't think it's necessary or they just are not renewed in their minds to where they understand the why of lifting your hands. And we talked about that a little bit, that your hands represent your life. So when you're lifting up hands, you're saying, God, I surrender my life to you. I give my life to you. Are you listening to me? We talked about bowing down on your knees. Now, you don't have to bow down on your knees all the time. I pray walking around a lot of times, but it is a good time, a good way to express your, uh, that God's in authority. It's a good way to express that you honor him and respect him and that you humble yourself before him and worship him by bowing down on your knees. I guarantee you this, when you come into the presence of God, the genuine presence of God is one of the reflex actions that you want to do. You sense his awesomeness. You sense his, his authority and his power. And you just want to honor him. You just want to get down on your knees and bow down before him expressing to him that he's supreme, he's in charge, he is God, and you bow down before him. Amen? Because in Philippians 2 and 9, uh, verse 10, should I say, it says that at, at, at the name of Jesus, every knee should and must bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. God is due the honor of bowing down. Amen? So we should practice that. It's a good practice. It's an act of your faith. Faith is an act. Faith always has a corresponding act of obedience when you have genuine faith in your heart. And we're going to talk about that some more today uh, because that's one of the reasons I believe it is one of the reasons the Bible shows us that people's purpose or reasons are wrong. They're doing things not out of faith. Now, I'll give you an example. There's a lot of people that go to church that are not saved. They've been told to pray a prayer and get right with God without being preached the gospel, the kingdom of the gospel, of salvation, of rebirth. And if you don't preach to people the gospel, Romans 10 tells us, how can they hear unless there's a preacher? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the anointed word of God. So if you don't give people the opportunity to have faith, by preaching the word of God to them, in this particular case, the gospel, the good news that they can be set free from sin, Satan, and eternal death, how can they have faith for it? So I submit to you, a lot of people are in church that aren't saved because they never had faith for it. They did a religious act, they prayed a prayer of salvation, but they didn't do it out of corresponding acts of obedience to what they believed in their heart. They just did it outwardly. Somebody say amen to that. This is better than y'all saying amen. This is better than you saying. This separates the religious folks from the reality folks, a real relationship with God. You got to have faith to have relationship with God. In Matthew 7, 13 through 14 in the Message Bible, it says, don't look for shortcuts to God. The market is flooded with surefire, easy going formulas for a successful life that can be practiced in your spare time. Don't fall for that stuff, even though crowds of people do. The way to life to God is vigorous and requires total attention. It requires fully persuadedness. It provides you renewing your mind. It provides, it, 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 it requires <laughs> you living a life as unto God. Faith is required to have a right why. Say that with me. 
Faith is required to have the right why, the right purpose, the right reason for what you do, the right reasons why you believe what you believe. I was an administrator at one organi organization at one time, and when I would do one-on-ones with different employees, I would always talk about the what and the why. Because when you know what I want you to do and why I want you to do it, uh, then it's easier to comply. And I have had a little jingle and I use it more for myself that when you have the what and the why, it's easier to comply. A lot of times people tell their children what to do and what not to do, and they don't explain the why, the purpose or the reason for doing it. When you understand what, a lot of time in church, we're told the what, you know, you need to pray, you need to pray, you need to pray, but we're not given the why, the reason. And that's what I believe God is putting his finger on in our hearts through this series that we can get our reasons and purpose lined up with his word so that we can be more effective and that we can bring him more glory. Now, faith is required to have a right why. If you go to Hebrews, give you a few moments to turn there. Hebrews 11 and verse one, it says, now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. Your five senses cannot pick up spiritual things. And as we read above uh, that God, Jesus said that the time is now that those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. And spiritual things cannot be perceived with your five senses. So it requires faith to have the right why, the right reason, the right purposes. Because living for God, living before God, requires living by faith because it's a spiritual kingdom. It's a spiritual way of doing things. It's not an outward thing. Now, what goes on on the inside is definitely going to affect what's on the outside. When you have surrendered fully to God your entire life, come on, and your, your hands automatically going to go up. When you recognize God to be the supreme authority and Lord of Lord and King of Kings, you automatically going to express it by bowing down before him. Come on, are you listening to me? Amen. I know you are. When you want to honor God, you, it's an automatic uh, reflex, spiritually speaking, to give, want to give something to him. And we give the tithe in doing that. In Hebrews 11 and 6, we're still talking about getting your why right, but it requires faith to have a right why, the right purpose, the right reasons for what you do. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please and be satisfactory to him, to God. Whoever would come near to God must necessarily believe that God exists and that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly and diligently seek him out. I like what the TPT translation says there in verse six. Also, it says without faith living within us, it would be impossible to please God. For we come to God in faith, knowing that he is real and that he rewards the faith of those who give all their passion and strength into seeking him. Amen. So when you have genuine faith, then your why is right. Your purpose for doing things are right. You're doing it out of response to what God has says. You're, you're doing it out of obedience. You're doing it out of love. You're doing that out of it because you believe he exists. People that just go to church but don't have live and active faith, they haven't meditated on the word of God or heard a anointed word preached to them, they're doing it just outwardly. It's called religion. Religion without living faith is no good. <laughs> it doesn't give you what God says you can have. It gives you an appearance of righteousness. It gives you an appearance of living for God. But when real life comes and you need the real God acting on your behalf or helping you and strengthening you, faith is the only way to go. Amen. 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 So we do people a disservice when we try to get them to do stuff, come to church, uh, get saved, come to church, to pray, to worship, without first giving them a word of faith, a word of God, an anointed word of God that generates or stimulates or activates confidence in God. So many churches give people the wrong why. 
<laughs> they give them the wrong purpose. Uh, I mean, churches have made people followers of a church or a ministry or a pastor or a denomination, but not followers of Jesus Christ, not followers of God. Amen. And that's where you get that's what's that that's what separates religion from the reality of serving a true and living God. Amen. So we just need to preach the gospel. We need to preach the word until people get full of confidence and fully persuaded that this is what God has said, that we ought to do what we ought to believe, what we ought to believe, what we ought to think. Amen. Then it will shape our reasons, our purpose for why we do what we do. Amen. Somebody say amen to God. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Uh, because here's the deal. God doesn't look at the outward stuff we do. Even when we come before the judgment, the, the seat, the judgment before the throne of Jesus Christ. Now there's going to be a judgment of sinners and there's going to be a judgment of believers. At the judgment of believers, it's not going to be necessary if you're going to heaven or not. You're going to get judged for everything you've done in this body for good or for bad. Amen. You're going to be judged for it. So we got to get our purpose right if you want to get some rewards come there. And when you get if you want to have some rewards in eternity, uh, because God looks on the inward parts, he requires truth in your inward part, in your heart, in your spirit, not just outwardly. Now, if you have it right on the inside, you can judge them by their fruits. Jesus said out of the inward parts, out of the in, inward parts, the good man flings forth good things. His words will be good. His his life will be good. He'll produce good good fruit. In 1 Samuel uh, 16 and 7, here God is revealing in his word, and there's several scriptures we could go to, but we'll go to a couple for time's sake. Uh, God reveals that that's how he is. He looks on your intent of heart, your motives, your purpose, your reason for doing things more than what's on the outside. Jesus said uh, the woman that he was watching when they were uh, giving offerings in the sanctuary in the synagogue and some were coming up giving a bunch of money out of their abundance. But the little woman, you may re remember the story, the little uh, widow woman came up with two little mites. We might say like two little pennies and put it in the offering. And Jesus said, huh, he could God revealed the intent and the motives of the woman heart. She was a true worshiper of God. She gave out a her lack. She gave all she had. Are you listening to me? So God wasn't looking at how much she gave. He was looking out, out of the motive and the purpose, her why. She wanted to honor God and give an offering unto God. But 1 Samuel 16 and 7 in the God's Word translation says, but the Lord told Samuel, don't look at his appearance or how tall he is because I have rejected him. God does not see as humans see. Humans look at outward appearances, but the Lord looks into the heart. The Lord looks at your why, your reason, your purpose, your motives. Amen. And we go. And that was a story where Samuel was picking the king that God was going to show him who's going to be king. And he thought it was going to be all these big, tall, strapping men of uh, of uh, of the family. Amen. But it wound up being David, the little scrawny kid out, of, out from keeping the sheep. Amen. Uh, Jesse's boys. Second Corinthians five and ten. Turn there, and we're coming around the corner here, getting ready to close. But Second Corinthians five and ten, it says, "For we must all appear and be revealed as we are before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive his pay according to what he has done in the body, whether good or evil, considering what his purpose and motive." have been. You can do good things with the wrong motive. You can do good things with the wrong why. We're going to let the word of God and the spirit of God jerk the slack out of us and make sure all our whys are right. All our purpose and reasons are why. We don't want to waste time doing this thing and then wind up we did it for nothing. Somebody say amen. And it goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, and what he has achieved being busy with giving himself and his attention to accomplishing. We never should get in a rut of doing things out of duty or because we feel like we're supposed to or have to, but it should be done from our heart as an act of love, an act of respect, an act of faith. 
as unto God. Amen. Well, with the last few moments we're going to take today, let's talk a little bit. I thought we were going to talk about today, but, you know, we're going to let the Lord have his way. And if the Lord say the same, we'll get to this next on the next episode of why of talking about, you know, individual things that we do as believers and have been doing and focusing in on what the word of God has to say the reason for it so that we can make sure our why, our reason, our purpose for doing those things or believing those things are in line with how God says they should be in line with his purposes, holding the purposes of Jesus's heart, doing it why God wants us to do it, like prayer. And that we're going to get to that next week. Why, why, why should we pray? Why do you pray? Not out of a duty, not because you have to, not because you should to. And I, I'm, if I keep going, I'll get into it. But you got to come back next week because I want to talk about this subject before we start getting into getting into any more particular subject title, subject lines uh, that the that we do in church, that we do in our lives, that we just do it, do it, do it, and we don't maybe have the right why. We never may never knew the right why we may have gotten off track with the right purpose for why what are we doing and we just need to get right back because when we fine tune our purposes and our reason for doing things then we become in line with God and then God can do greater things in us through us and for us and by us somebody say amen to that but if your purposes if your why and your reason is wrong God can't get involved he's not going to bless you and prosper you if your purpose for wanting the money is wrong to just spend it on yourself god's not going to get into your ministry come on <laughs> or your function in the ministry whether it be the worship leader or the preacher or the pastor or the deacon if your reason for wanting to be blessed and anointed and powerful so that you can make your name great so that you can be famous and sell a lot of books or something if your purpose is wrong now that might happen but your purpose and your motive got to be right first i mean david's motive was right he was a man after god's own heart and he became the king i'm not saying you can't be promoted and have a lot but your motive your reason your purpose your why has to line up and be acceptable for god you've got to live before god from the inside and not just the things you do on the outside Here's are some things we want to talk about, as I said, before we close on things that are needed. It's not all inclusive, but these are a few key things on how to get your why right. When God begins to put his finger on different reasons in your life and purposes you have and intents and motivations, why you doing what you do and believing what you believe. When God begins to reveal to you that's wrong, your why is wrong, your purpose for why you're doing what you're doing is wrong. Here's three things that you need to look at to get your why right, to get your purpose right, to get your reason for doing what you're doing right before God and pleasing before him. Number one, you must be born again. Now, I said this earlier and it bears repeating. There's a lot of people that are in church, serving in church, uh, uh, in the choir, worshiping, in the band, come on, sitting in the pews, uh, serving as an usher on the parking lot. And you never got saved. You never been born again. You just came down and prayed the prayer, but you had no faith for it. You just thought that's what you're supposed to do. Come to church and that's it. No, you need to have an experience with God. You need to must, you must be born again for your whys and your purposes and your reason for living to be right before God. Number one, you got to have a genuine a conversion. You got to get born again. Second Corinthians five and 17 says, therefore, if any person is engrafted into Christ, the Messiah, that gets saved, get born again, he or she is a new creation, a new creature altogether. The old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away and behold, the fresh and new has come. I tell you, me and many others I know, when you get a true conversion, that you get preached the gospel, come on, and you get faith in your heart that it's true that God is going to forgive you and cleanse you and turn you into a whole new being, a new creation, and all things are going to pass away. You change. Your desires change. Your want to change. Now, there's some, some things you have to learn, you know, renewing your mind, and we're going to talk about that here in a minute. You've got to get a different lifestyle. You've got to be taught some things uh, because this 
flesh, this physical makeup doesn't get changed. The real you gets changed. Your spirit, your heart gets changed into a righteous man and woman. Number one, to get your why right, to get your reason and purpose for doing things right is you must be born again. Number two, to get your why right, to get your reasons and your purpose for what you do right before God, you got to do it by faith. You can't do it out of your own uh, willpower and hu human strength. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing the word of God. Amen. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, an anointed word of God, a spoken word of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, or when you're reading the word of God, it's quickened to you by the Holy Spirit, and that's when faith comes. Faith gives you the ability to perceive those things that are not revealed to your five senses as being real. And when you see those things or perceive those things, then you connect to those spiritual things, and faith urges you or prompts you to do certain things. If you go back and read, the, uh, I don't, I'm not going to read it all today, but go read the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, in particular in the Amplified Bible. You'll see when men and women were in faith, uh, I'll just give you some highlights. Hebrew 11 and 4, it says, uh, prompted, actuated by faith, Abel brought a better gift and a more acceptable sacrifice to Cain. Because of faith, Enoch was caught up and transferred to heaven. Uh, verse 7, prompted by faith, Noah being forewarned, forewarned by God concerning the events of which as yet there was no visible sign, took heed and diligently and reverently constructed and prepared an ark for the deliverance of his own family. In verse 8, uh, Hebrews 11, it says, urged on by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and went forth to a place where he was destined to receive as an inheritance. And he didn't know where he was going. The key thing I was want to underline here, and if you keep reading through the book of Hebrews, it talks about all these men and women, when they were in genuine faith, they heard God's word and believed it and accepted it, it prompted them, it actuated them, it urged them. Faith will cause you to act. Faith will give you corresponding act. And I submit to you that when you pray, when you give, when you worship, when you go to church, when you are kind to people or when you're loving to people, you must do it by faith because then it's coming from God. God will urge you the confidence before God that he says, love your neighbors, uh, love those who despitefully uh, use you or despise you. You'll be urged by your faith, your confidence that this is what I need to do. This is my purpose for doing this. This is why. Because God said, come on, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We could get into that and teach a whole series, but just giving you some things that you can look at that as God shows you or reminds you of the reason why you're doing what you're doing, the purpose for what you're doing. How do I straighten this thing out? How do I get back to having right purpose, a right why. One thing is you must be born again. Make sure you've made uh, uh, had a, a true conversion. Nobody can do that but you and God. Amen. If you didn't change when you prayed the prayer, I'd say just get down on your knees again and ask God, God, I want to have it right. I'll give you an example and I'm going a little longer than I thought, but this is needed to be said. When I first got saved, amen, I got baptized. Now, I've been baptized four times. You say, why did you get baptized four times? I'll tell you why. The first time I got baptized, there was no faith involved. I was in a church. I won't say the denomination. That's not neither here or there. But I went down because they told me to. Somebody, My mama told me to get and put on the white gown. I was nine years old and I got baptized, okay? Didn't do it in faith. I didn't have a, any purpose or reason. I didn't understand what I was doing. Now, I'm not saying if you were nine years old, you didn't know. I just didn't know. Okay. Uh, and then I got baptized again because I was in this church. I went away to college and I was in Michigan and I got baptized. And this particular pastor said, well, I'm the pastor and all any people going to my church, I want to baptize them. So I got baptized again. Again, my reason, my why for doing it was not because of faith. Nobody preached baptism to me. Nobody told me why the reason that God has said I should be baptized. Oh, you know, Jesus was baptized and he understood why. He knew the reason to satisfy all righteousness. But uh, let's keep going. I got baptized again. This time I got baptized because in this particular domination, they figured there's certain words you got to say over it. 
That was the reason that the why was wrong. Then I got baptized for the fourth time and someone preached to me out of the word of God, why? The reason that God has said you should be baptized, that it was a corresponding act of my faith, that I was buried with Jesus Christ and I was resurrected with him to walk in the newness of life. Amen. And I got faith, confidence in God that this would I ought to do. So it prompted me, it urged me, I want to be baptized. So what I'm saying is you must do it by faith. And the last thing we want to talk about before we close today, the third thing, and this is not all inclusive, but these are three biggies. If you want to have your why, your purpose and your reasons for what you do and why you do right before God, living before him, you've got to transform your mind. You have to have a transformation of your mind, the way you think, the basis, the purpose, the reasons. I mean, during the recent election and stuff, I've heard different people and and the devil was tricky, dividing believers, dividing Christians over some of the things that were going on in the election. But if we all get into the word of God and renew our minds, our why, our purpose and our reasons for what we do will be in a line with God's reasons and his purpose purpose for what we do, even why you vote and who you vote for, what what church you go to, uh, how you spend your money, how you treat your husband, how you treat your wife, how you treat your children. If you get your mind transformed, change the way you think, it will change your why to line up with the word of God. Because in Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Verse two, do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after and adapted to its eternal, superficial customs, but be transformed changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideas and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourself what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. And one other couple of scriptures I wanna read as we close in 1 Corinthians 10 and 31, Still talking about getting your why right, your purpose, your reason for what you do and why you do it. Uh, it says in 1 Corinthians 10 and 31, it says, So then whether you eat or drink or whatever you may do, do all for the honor and glory of God. And Colossians 3 and 23, a similar uh, sentiment in the word of God. It says, whatever may be your task, work at it heartily from the soul as something done for the Lord and not for men. So we'll come back next week and we're gonna pick up where we left off here and we're gonna dive, if the Lord say the same, dive into some particular things that we are doing as believers or should be doing, like praying, giving, uh, meditating in your word. You need to get your why right. If you get your why right, your reason why you're doing it, then it'll be easy to do it and you'll do it and you'll get the full benefit of doing it. It won't be religion, it won't be uh, something because you feel like you got to do it. It won't be something you'll be doing because you, you, if I don't do it, something might happen to me. No, it'll be prompted by faith and it'll be something enjoyable and something pleasurable for you. And more importantly, it'll please God. So let's take a few moments for those who have never made Jesus the Lord of their lives or you haven't ever experienced a true conversion where you were changed into a new person born from above. I want to lead you in a prayer today that God will do it for you. In Romans 10, it says, if you believe in your heart about the gospel, that this world was, that all the people born in this world, that includes you and me, were born separated from God, a spiritual death, separated from him. We are born sinners because of one man's disobedience, the first man, Adam, and his wife, Eve, that you believe in your heart that and that God, through one man's obedience, Jesus Christ, the begotten, only begotten Son of God, he came and took your place and my place and died in your place because the judgment for sin, disobeying God and throwing off his restraints and not doing things his ways, 
is death, separation from him. Now that separation from him also puts into motion not only a spiritual death, separation from him forever, which everybody that's separated from him uh, is going to spend up in, spend eternity in a place called hell. Now hell wasn't main, made for mankind, but mankind will join the devil and his cohorts because in heaven there won't be any sin. So you won't be able to come to heaven as a sinner. But because of one man's obedience that the justice or the judgment for sin is death, that he took our place, that if we believe that, God has said, I, I'll, 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 I will accept this. If you believe through this one man's obedience, it cancels out the one man's disobedience, then I'll, I'll restore you. I'll give you a righteous nature. I'll make you my own son and daughter again. I'll make you righteous. I'll just declare you righteous and create in you a new spirit. I'll give you that original intent that I made mankind to be able to have fellowship with me. So if you believe that now in your heart, this is what your next step is. You need to say it, confess it with your mouth. That's just how it is. That's what God has said in Romans, the 10th chapter. So just pray this with me. Say, Father God, I recognize that I am a sinner and I come to repent before you to change, but I can't do it without your help. I ask that you forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness and make me right. I believe it's all possible because I do believe that Jesus died in my place and you raised him from the dead and he lives forevermore at your right hand. In Jesus name I ask. Amen. Now, if you prayed that with sincerity and I'm believing you did right now, the Holy Spirit is working in you and changing you into a whole new person that never existed before. You're being born again. Amen. But there's one other thing before we close that you need to ask God for. If, the, if you've been born again already and you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit, if you just got saved today, born again, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what we need to live a successful and victorious Christian life on planet Earth. Because the Holy Spirit is for us disciples who are still here he is to us like Jesus was to the disciples in Jesus's day. Jesus was their teacher. He was their guide. He strengthened them. He empowered them. He interceded and prayed for them. Amen. And Jesus said, it's better that I go because if I don't, the promise of the spirit will not come. And it's better because not only will he be with you like I am, but he'll be in you. That means no matter where you are in the world, no matter what time of day or night it is, you can have the presence of God with you and in you. So pray this prayer with me. Say, Father God, I want everything that you have for me. I ask that you would fill me, baptize me with the Holy Spirit in Jesus name. Amen. Now receive it. Begin to yield to the Holy Spirit. Take some time after this video goes, goes off. Lift your hands up to him. Uh, uh, and just begin to thank him and praise him for salvation. Thank him and praise him for forgiving you of your sins. Thank him and praise him for the precious gift of the Holy Spirit. And, the, and God will help you. He knows how to help you. He knows exactly how you think and how you talk. And he'll begin to influence your thinking. And you just begin to yield. And then the Holy Spirit will begin to help you. He'll begin to give you understanding of the word of God. He'll strengthen you. He'll refresh you. He'll empower you. He'll also give you the supernatural ability to speak in a language that some translation calls speaking in tongue, but it should, that word tongue means a language. And when you speak these words out by faith, amen, the Holy Spirit doesn't take you over. You just by faith, Take the words that you're hearing coming up out of your spirit into your mind. Speak them and the Holy Spirit will begin to give you a language. And when you're speaking in this language supernaturally by the help of the Holy Spirit, you're talking to God. You're praying, you're worshiping, you're praising God in a language that's perfect. And when we pray God's will, 1 John 5, 14 tells us when we ask anything according to God's will, we get it. So it's a great way to get a fast start on your life of living before God and pleasing him. 
So until next time, we just want to thank you again for joining us. And remember who the sun sets free is free indeed. That's you and that's me. So let's get about the father's business and shake some salt and shine some light and bring glory to him by plundering hell and populating heaven by preaching the good news of the kingdom of God and that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Amen.